good afternoon, everyone. Uh, and uh, good evening to Professor Stuart Fries. Um, today, we have the uh, honor and privilege of uh, having Professor Stuart Fries from Australia, Sydney, Australia, uh, to uh, deliver a talk on his book titled Cruelty or Humanity, Challenges, Opportunities, and Responsibilities. Stuart Fries, AM, is Professor Emeritus at the University of Sydney and, the professor, and former professor of social work and social policy and co-founder Sydney University's Center for Peace and Conflict Studies and inaugural director, Sydney Peace Foundation. Author of poetry uh, anthologies and books on social justice, including Cruelty or Humanity, which was published in 2020 which was nominated for the 2021 British Academy Book Prize. He was awarded the Order of Australia for Service to International Relations in 2005 and the Jerusalem Peace Prize in 2018. You're welcome, uh, Professor Rees. Uh, we have up to two hours for this session and it's totally up to you, uh, however you like to conduct it. So over to you, sir. Thank you very much and thank you for uh, thank you for inviting me. I'm sorry I can't see all of the students, but I look forward to hearing your questions when I've finished. And I will, um, I'll try to speak as clearly as possible. And I think you, uh, they will all have uh, some kind of outline that I sent you. Is that correct? Uh, as to what? Yes. As to the step. Okay, that's good. That's good. As to the steps we're going to um, follow this evening. The topic really is, is the title of the book, Cruelty or Humanity. But in fact, that's a question for all of you in the next 20 or 30 or 40 years of your lives. The question before the world is a choice between continued cruelty or a struggle to effect and recognize and achieve a common humanity. So it's not just the title of a book, and I'll hold up the, I don't know whether you can see the cover. Um, um, the, the, this character here represents the Scandinavian god Thor, a, a god of cruelty and destruction. And the figure with wings above the god Thor is Phoenix rising from the ashes, which is meant to re represent uh, a future of hope. Well, let's go first of all into the question of definitions. And uh, um, I can almost hear you thinking, or at least I hope I can. Uh, my argument about throughout the book, and I've looked at cruelty around the world on every continent and in every government. The argument is that whatever the government, whether it's a uh, democracy, a dictatorship, or a religious theocracy, cruelty has been at the center of policies. And you'll notice that in particular, the victims are usually women and children, but we'll, we'll be a bit more specific in a minute. But that centerpiece of policy, which has affected all of your lives and the lives of all your, your predecessors is never acknowledged. It's, you've, you've never heard a government saying, yes, of course, our priority is cruelty to, to vulnerable people. You, and if you look at the policy textbooks in whatever language, you will hardly see the word cruelty even in an index. Let me try and be um, clear about what I mean by cruelty. It's, it's the infliction, infliction of unnecessary pain and suffering on body and mind. And you'll notice if you were, uh, if you um, if you stay with me and stay awake and stay interested, which is my job, uh, that there's a kind of what I would call almost a, an unholy trinity of ideas about cruelty. We're talking about cruelty to human beings, but we're also talking about cruelty to animals, and we're also talking about cruelty to planet Earth. And given that the given that climate change and how in particular your generation 
is going to have to live with the consequences of climate change shows you how widespread the nature of cruelty, uh, cruelty is. Um, now, of course, even, even though it's, it's massively denied, and you'll hear in a minute, the amount of effort that governments, no. the amount of efforts that governments put into denying cruelty. If you looked at international law, you will find a whole range of conventions and statutes that make uh, cruelty illegal, that torture and cruelty is illegal. If you looked at the, the famous Universal Declaration of Human Rights of 1948, you will see that cruelty, inhuman treatment to others um, uh, is, is forbidden. If you looked at the United Nations Convention on Torture and Cruelty uh, and Inhuman and other great degrading treatment of people, you will see again that cruelty is prohibited. If you look at the Convention on the Rights of the Child, you will see that uh, cruelty is, is, um, is not permitted. But we've, we're living now in, in, in in an age in which there has been an indifference to uh, international law. You're all growing up, you're all living, you're all surviving at a time when, when um, even truth is not regarded as all that important. We've, we've watched the, 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 the four awful years of the Trump administration in the United States in which um, your truth is as good as the next person's and you don't know who to believe. You remember the check, the check system that the American media, or you may have noticed, had on whether uh, Trump uh, ever told the truth. I think there were 20,000 records of him fabricating uh, evidence. So, so cruelty, uh, two major points then in this first five minutes. Cruelty is central to uh, government's policies in every kind of government. And secondly, uh, it is every, every piece of international law nevertheless prohibits the cruelty. I mean, I, I'm a particular specialist in, in, in Middle Eastern affairs, in particular with regard to the, the, the longest and the most brutal military occupation since the Second World War. And that's a reference to the way the, the, the Israeli governments treat the Palestinians. The Israelis, for example, break international law with impunity almost every day, but are never held accountable. So we've got that um, frightful humanity, uh, humanitarian chemical mix. The cruelty is a major issue. It is forbidden, but it is massively denied. So let's go into the um, let's go into the, um, the examples of, of treatment. In my you will you will know, all of you will know that at this moment you've got the greatest movement of people around the world uh, since since records were kept. I'm talking about 65 million uh, refugees. I'm talking about similar, a slightly smaller number of asylum seekers. I'm talking about the cruelty of governments to refugees and asylum seekers. For example, in many countries, and Australia is one of them, <coughs> call asylum seekers illegals. And there's every effort to build walls, to turn back boats, to detain and prison, and prison uh, asylum, people seeking asylum. And yet the Refugee Convention of 1951 says that anybody is entitled to seek refuge in a safe place to, if they are fleeing um, danger and persecution. So it is not illegal to be an asylum seeker. Yet some of the massive um, cruelties are, that are occurring at the moment concern the world's inability to know how to cope with the massive um, influx of, of refugees. Excuse me. 
Um, if you think for a minute, and I'm sure you've noticed what has been going on in Af Afghanistan, the desperate uh, efforts to evacuate people who were frightened of the Taliban, the desperate efforts of people who remain, particularly women and children, to escape across the border into Pakistan, which, as I understand it, already has about three million refugees. And at the other end of Afghanistan, Afghanistan, the desperate efforts of people to escape into Iran, which also has a similar number, massive, massive numbers of, um, of refugees. So let's 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 come now to the to the issue that's probably going will be in a way clearest to you, or the question that will be perhaps on the minds of most of you, who are the perpetrators and who are the, who are the victims? Um, let me give you a generalization immediately. The generalizations in the social sciences are quite, are important because it's the, um, it's, it's, it's a truth that holds until proven otherwise. Disproportionately, most of the perpetrators are men almost entirely men. And when I've looked at, uh, looked at um, uh, different forms of religious persecution, I've discovered that um, it, it, it's, it's, the cruelty seldom has much to do with religion. It's about tribal customs handed down by men whose identity is, is bolstered by attempting to say that they're much more important than women. You can see that at the moment in the appalling, the unimaginable behavior of the Taliban in, um, in, in Afghanistan. So, so the, the, the perpetrators of victims rely on that process, which we call stigma. You all know about st stigma. I noticed a large proportion of the students I'm speaking to tonight come from India, which has an appalling, destructive, cruel, violent caste system, which the wonderful Mahatma Gandhi spent almost a lifetime trying to, to challenge, if not to erode. So the stigma, stigma goes on around the world. It's an attempt by the more powerful people, the people who have an idea of themselves as superior, are trying to bolster their sense of superiority by critical judgments of what we call the other. Now, the other might be, um, uh, they might be unmarried mothers. They may be people of the wrong color. They may be people of the wrong gender. They may be people who of the wrong, wrong religious beliefs. You can see the, you can see in Afghanistan, for example, the, the constant persecution of the Hazara people by the dominant tribe, the Pashtun. I spent a lot of time myself in the middle of the Sri Lankan civil war when the, the attempt of the dominant Sinhalese was to label and to persecute, and in fact, to, to try to get rid of the, um, the, um, the Tamils. I spent a lot of time in the uh, in peace negotiations in the um, Israeli-Palestinian conflict, where the Israelis behave as though Palestinians are not really human beings. Previous prime ministers of um, of Israel have said that um, Palestinians don't exist. The present prime minister um, uh, Naftali Bennett boasts that he's killed lots of them and what is wrong with that he says. So you've got this, you've got this massive system of stigmatization, this placing a stigma on other human beings, which has maintained, <coughs> maintained cruelty over the ages. A report came out today in Europe about the, the persecution and the cruelty over decades and decades of unmarried mothers. In, it, it particularly referred to, the, to women in, in Catholic countries because to be an unmarried mother, in other words, for a young woman to fall pregnant before she was married was regarded as an appalling stigma. So 
uh, for decades in, in Ireland, these uh, young women, tens of thousands of them, were, were kept in what, would, what were known as laundries. They were basically slave labor for the Catholic Church. They were punished for falling pregnant. So this, this stigmatization has gone on for ages. And you can hear, you will have all seen the conduct of the, the Black Lives Matter campaign that's occurred across America and in other countries, which is really about a protest against the stigmatization, against the cruelty, against the official and unofficial policies, which determine that uh, people of the wrong color, the wrong religious background, the wrong ethnicity um, should be stigmatized and, um, and persecuted. You can see to the, um, the, the cruelty in, in particular policies. I, I'm going to, I'll make a distinction at this point between direct and indirect cruelty. I mean, there's, there are two pandemics um, going around the world at the moment. These are pretty direct forms of um, the visible events. Two pandemics. One is called COVID. You know, we're all at danger of being infected. I don't know how. I'm in a fortunate country which manages to give most people two vaccines. But, but, the, but what is known as vaccine apartheid means that people in developing much poorer countries either have no vaccines or very few. So there's, that's, that's one pandemic. There's another pandemic which has been going on for centuries, is called domestic violence. It's, in other words, the, the, the idea that men should mostly use their tongues and their fists and their elbows and their guns to treat women badly if they disagree with them, to humiliate them. And that, that, that I regard that as a, as a, as a pandemic. It's it's about the use of it's about the use of violence in a top down manner. I'm coming in a minute to talk about uh, to talk about um, power. Let me go back to the. Let me be clear about the distinction between direct and indirect violence. Domestic violence is is direct. If you're beaten up, uh, physically punished. That's, that's pretty direct, it's observable. Almost all of the 30 students in this class tonight would probably, uh, probably agree with that. The, the second example is about the indirect consequences of social and economic policies which punish poor people, which lead to homelessness, which lead to unemployment, which, lead to, which contribute to suicide. So though I'm going to say something about social and economic policies. For example, the, the free market policies pursued in apparently rich countries like United States, United Kingdom, and most of the countries of Europe have resulted in massive social and economic inequalities. The inequalities exist within a country, but also between countries. So that's an example of indirect cruelty. It's indirect violence, it's indirect cruelty. To come back to the direct violence, I, I would, I'm going to ask you a question it's, you can answer for yourselves, and it would be the question I put my, to myself. What, what actually prompted me to write this book? Was there a particular incident that so motivated me, that so appalled me, that made me so upset and angry that I said I have to do something about it. And I imagine that in each of you, in your lives, there will have been and there are incidents which have provoked you to, uh, to take a stand on, on certain, um, uh, certain issues. And I, met, I, I, I hope I I hope you can still hear me and, and still see me. I'm not you. Okay, you can. Okay. <laughs> um, 
the the incident the incident that that provoked me was happened to a, a brave young man in Saudi Arabia. He was known as a blogger. His name is Rafe Badawi. And we're talking about the year 2012. He was trying to make an appeal for slightly more openness, transparency, and democracy in the kingdom of Saudi Arabia. And uh, they charged him with being insulting to the Prophet Muhammad, hauled him away, sentenced him to a thousand lashes and 10 years in prison for something which in most of the democracies of the world, nobody would take any notice of. And the savagery of, the, of that cruelty, the extent of that cruelty uh, made me sit up. I mean, I'd seen cruelty because I've worked all over the world, but that particular incident affecting uh, Badawi made me, um, uh, made me sit up and say, this is medieval. This is, this is sadism. In the, in the name of a government. Sadism is, is really a fascination with cruelty for its own sake. It's like the um, English schoolmaster when he was beating a little boy saying, this is gonna hurt me more than it hurts you. It was, it was as it were, a pleasure in sadism. So, so let me say, let's, so we've got the distinction between direct, and indirect um, cruelty. And that carries with it the distinction between violence and nonviolence. Because when I, when I come to the end of this evening, we're going to be talking about um, the, a language for humanity, a language which each of us can share if we're going to generate any greater optimism about the future. So that, that transition between violence and nonviolence is another theme that's going to be hopefully running through your minds and even through your veins as we spend this, um, this evening uh, together. The, the, the victimization, I mean, I know that sounds, uh, you'll be familiar with that phrase, the business of finding a victim. You can see it in schoolyard bullying. Some of you may, as younger people, have experienced bullying. You, or you've observed it. Or you've observed the caste system. Or you've observed racism. Or you've certainly observed appalling violence to women. I know there's a sort of pandemic of rape of women across, across a country like India. It's not confined to India by any means. And you will see, you will remember that Two, more than 2,000 children at the Mexican-American border uh, a year, during the Trump administration were placed in iron cages and they were left there for weeks. And then they were, dis without their parents knowing, they were dispersed to different parts of the United States. And there's about a thousand of them for whom, who have not been able to be reconnected with their parents. So this, this business of what to do with the unwanted, what to do with the vulnerable, what to do with the powerless, what to do with those who've been stigmatized is, has become a persistent, a persistent, um, a persistent future feature of domestic and foreign policies, domestic and foreign policies. Now I'm going to come, and I hope you're still all wide awake and with me, um, because I'm trying to I'm trying to speak slowly and pausing in the middle, and I'm looking forward to your questions. I'm now going to come to the perhaps the central issue of the book and a central issue for all of you, which is about the exercise of power. Each of you is involved in different ways. You're all the product of families. You're all the members of organizations. You're all, you've all been in educational institutions. You are people who exercise power or who are on the receiving end of power. And the theory about the exercise of power is pretty central to this book, but it's central to the question for all of you 
as how you deal with the with the struggle between cruelty or humanity. I want to suggest there's that um, power exists on a continuum. At one end is what I call one dimensional power. In the middle of the continuum is what I would call two dimensional. And at the end is multi dimensional, three dimensional. You've all been the bent, you've all suffered from the exercise of one dimensional power. One dimensional power. You can see it all over the world. You can see it in every government. You can see it in every family. It's, it's the exercise of power disproportionately by men, which says to you, the only thing I really value is your obedience. In other words, it is, it is a, an exercise of, of influence given from the top down. You can see it in the military, you can see it in prisons, you can see it in what is referred to in textbooks as the patriarchy, the operation of a patriarchy. And it's very difficult to, I mean, a lot of education, I'm not sure about your, the education you've received in school systems, but a lot of education has been conducted by the top down exercise of power. You can see the terrible, vivid examples of it in the Taliban striding around with their massive guns um, in the streets of um, in the streets of Afghanistan at the moment, determining that um, women should should not be allowed to be seen, women should not be allowed to be educated, women should not be allowed to work, women should be kept to, should should be covered up entirely if they go if they come into into um, into the public. So this, this and, and most of the world's atrocities, most of the world's genocides are committed by the uncritical use of the top of top down power. And the, the antidote to that, the only antidote has been the struggle for democracy, for openness, for consultation, for sharing of decision making. And in, that applies to every context. One context is the home, another context is the school, the university, the streets, NGO organizations, or, or in international relations. The same issue occurs all the time. It's about the top-down exercise of power. And when you look at, when you measure cruelty, it will be very difficult to find any incident when, when, when we are not observing the top-down, one-dimensional exercise of power. The point that the reason it persists for so long in everybody's lives for centuries, whether it is by kings or dictators or monarchs, is that it's, it's relatively easy. You just tell people what to do. You follow the rules of <coughs> the... Um, the Italian political scientist theorist from the 16th century Machiavelli, who said, look, the, the purpose of government is to instill fear. As long as people fear the ruler, then um, it doesn't matter if you have a reputation for cruelty, because you can control people. You have to instill, you have to instill fear. And if you go to theocracies like Iran or Saudi Arabia or parts of Indonesia, you will you will see that that ex, that fear in operation. I've seen it also in the United States. I've seen it experienced by indigenous people in in um, in Australia. I mean, most modern nations, most modern nations have been built on the slaughter of indigenous people. In the Americas, in South America, in North America, in Australia, and and if you look at the history of India, the history of India was built in part on the bloodshed of the Indian people. It was called, it was called colonization. So that one-dimensional power is. This is what I want you to hang on to. It's like a pendulum as well as a continuum. If we move along the 
continuum a little. You've got, this is a struggle in a way for democracy. You've got what I call two dimensional power that says, well, we include women as well as men in the decision making. We might even include children as well as adults. So we're beginning to include more people in the in the consultative process, in the in the governing process, in the in the struggle to give dignity and respect. I mean, the word dignity pretty crucial, and I'll come come to that again in a minute because it's the it was the centerpiece. It is the centerpiece of the thirty clauses in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. So that two-dimensional power was sometimes referred to as being pluralist. Pluralist meaning we include as many people as possible in the, in the consultative process. We include women as well as men, children as well as adults, uh, people from different uh, religious and ethnic groups. But that, that process still only operates within, within a system, within a system that says there has to be state power. There has to be um, the power of, the, of the, the head of the tribe or the head of the family. There has to be, um, there have to be a whole set of rules which you can't, uh, you can't challenge. I mean, if, you, if I was to go, to, if I was to come to India now and, and interview um, a different uh, Muslim groups about the conduct of Mahendra Modi, the prime minister, I'd get a pretty different uh, story than if I was to interview dominant uh, Hindu groups. What I'm most interested in, and what I hope you're going to be enthusiastic about and interested in, is what I would call three-dimensional or multi-dimensional power. That is the exercise of power. And it, uh, this is the humanity part of the book, the humanity part of the story. We're struggling to move away from the fascination with cruelty towards uh, hope for humanity. And that comes through, um, through what, I've, what I'm calling multidimensional power. It can be expressed in, in all sorts of ways. The essence of it is that it's non-destructive. The essence of it is that it enhances people's lives. The essence of it is that it's creative it's curious it's what we what many authors would call enlightening you can see i don't know what great poetry what great music great art um uh, you the the 30 people or so that i'm speaking to this evening what you enjoy but many of those expressions of great art great poetry great music um are expressions of multi-dimensional power, in which cruelty is not on the agenda, but the struggle to create a sense of humanity, uh, humanity is. There was a famous um, English poet called Wordsworth, William Wordsworth. Most people think that he wrote poems about daffodils, about flowers, about birds rising in the sky. He was a romantic. But he also observed the cruelties associated with the Industrial Revolution. The, basically, the introduction of slave labor at low wages in terrible conditions in factories, which we, which we now, we, <laughs> until a few years ago, we called it progress. And we managed to destroy large parts of the environment, pollute the atmosphere, pollute the rivers, uh, exhaust exhaust the oceans of, of fish, and yet we still manage to call it um, progress. He said, he wrote a poem called Humanity. He was protesting about the cruelty, which, which I've observed all around the world, but he was talking about the, ninth, the early part of the 19th century. And he wrote a couple of lines. What a fair world were ours for verse to paint. If power, could live at ease with self-restraint. So that's that's the um, that's the um, uh, that's the importance of multi-dimensional power. 
it's, I often say to politicians who behave like bullies, who just want people to obey them, look, why don't you, why don't you try to, to think and behave in a multi-dimensional way? Because it'll be good for your mental health and it'll be good for your physical health. I don't think I've ever met anybody who thinks that on their deathbed, they will look back on their life and say, I wish I'd bullied more people. I wish I'd punished more people. I wish I'd been more cruel. I wish I'd limited the, the, the lifetime opportunities of more people. But we might say, I wish I'd uh, had a sense of creativity. I wish, I wish I'd been able to give a great um, uh, hospitality. I wish I'd, um, I wish I'd uh, known about more wonderful piece of, pieces of creative music and art and poetry. I've been involved in negos peace negotiations in dangerous parts of Africa, for example, with Mugabe's thugs in Zimbabwe. And I used to say, I never, the point about peace negotiations is that it's never wise to um, start with the subject that you're meant to be there to address, because you want to find out, you want to find out something about the people who are sitting across the table from you. I mean, I don't know too much about you. I was given a list. I know we're half and half men and women. I know there's a spread of, of interesting countries that you come from. But I'd want to know more. I'd want to know what I call the promise of biography, the promise that each of you can realize in your life if the, um, if the opportunities to, um, uh, to reach your, your dreams, if you like, are, are, um, are realized. So, so that, that business of the one-dimensional, two-dimensional, three-dimensional power is crucial to the struggle for humanity. And the struggle, um, and this is not, this is just not a Western idea, the struggle or the agenda lies in the most important document of the 20th century. Um, it was 1948, soon after the United Nations was created. It was a document, it's not a Western document. It was signed by all the nations of the world at that time, the Universal Declaration of Human Rights. There are 30 clauses that and the the respect for those clauses is about the is about a quality of life for all the world's people irrespective of gender irrespective of age irrespective of religion and race and uh, uh, and ethnicity and there's one concept a concept against cruelty and for humanity that runs through every clause of the Universal Declaration. It's about dignity. It's about every human being being afforded dignity. Some of you, hopefully most of you, are familiar with the appalling treatment of the Rohingya people in Burma, what used to be in Myanmar, what used to be called Burma. They finished up largely, almost a million of them, on a, on a treeless, muddy, hillside in Bangladesh. The official Myanmar line was that they didn't exist. So the, the, um, so the one dimensional, the vicious, cruel, sadistic use of power by stigmatizing that particular group of people, the Rohingya, has seen a massive exodus of a, of a, whole, of a whole nation. And the same is applied in my judgment to the to the people of Palestine. You might want to ask me more more questions um, about that. I'm not sure how we're going for time because um, I'm just going to check for a minute. Um, OK, we've got about another 15 minutes of putting up with me talking. If that's OK, if you can hang on to and hang on to your seat or um, whatever you're doing. I'm going to move now to 
the, as it were, the more optimistic side of the story, which, which is about the struggle for humanity. That's the agenda. That's the agenda for all of you in, in your lives. Right, right, at, right at this moment. There are three particular challenges to humanity. Um, one is climate change. What around the world is being called an existential threat. Most of you luckily are many, many, many years younger than me. You and your children, your generation is gonna have to deal with this threat. And it's the, the cruelty to planet earth which has which has uh, produced this threat it's the it's the greed the greed of human beings which has produced this threat the 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 idea that we could go on living uh, and as though the world had infinite resources so that's one major problem you face the second is the threat of nuclear war the possession the idea that nations should be entitled to possess nuclear weapons that could wipe out the planet, if not just the people on it. And the third overriding issue is what we, what I know as neoliberal economics. You're all the product, you might be the beneficiaries, I'm not sure, of a laissez-faire neoliberal economic system that basically says life is a competition. You have to compete as best you can in the marketplace of life. And uh, some of you will be winners, and unfortunately, there'll be lots of losers. So the question for humanity is, how do we, how do we produce thinking about a utopia that addresses those problems? And a wonderful English satirist said, um, if, you don't, if, you don't in your, if you don't have in your minds um, a map of the world, which includes utopia, then it's not worth looking at. In other words, you have a moral and an intellectual obligation to think about what a human rights dominated world, that is to say, a humanitarian based world would, would look like. I mean, one idea immediately is to, is to get rid of fences and walls and um, uh, passport controls and and uh, and other forms of exclusion and punishment. But I want to. Um, uh, uh, but the essence of that, the essence of the of the struggle for humanity, is about the non-destructive, the life-enhancing, the multi-dimensional exercise of power. I'm going to the 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 book that I've written is is peppered with poetry. There's a lot of poetry in it. It could have been music, it could have been art, but I actually chose poetry, partly because the examples of cruelty that I witnessed in South America, North America, in Saudi Arabia and in Indonesia, uh, 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 and in the United States was, was so awful that I wanted something that would make it feel and seem less awful. And I chose I chose poetry. Um, um, there was a wonderful Australian, and, and here I'm going to talk about a little bit about the contribution of the arts, the world of the arts, of poetry and music and dance, to uh, and a great a greater sense of um, of humanity. It's essentially it's essentially a language of non-violence. I used to teach in university in Colorado in the States, and I had a wonderful friend who she was from Colombia in South America, and she taught a course called The Sociology of Dance. And it was about the way all the peoples of South America had managed to use dancing to express their protest against dictatorships. Most of them lived at that time on, uh, under dictatorship. If I look at the if I look at the great Russian composer Shostakovich, you will know that during the purges by Stalin, 
and probably more, far more people were murdered by Stalin than lost their lives in, in the Holocaust under Hitler. And Shostakovich wrote, wrote, uh, wrote many symphonies, but one in particular, which he conducted for the first time in 1937 in Leningrad, is called the Fifth Symphony. It was a protest against the dictatorship of, of, um, of uh, Joseph Stalin, the dictator. Some of you will have heard of, or some of you will know, I mean, I was brought up as a classical musician before I became a before I became a social scientist. Beethoven wrote nine symphonies. Here's a wonderful exercise of an expression of life enhancing use of power. The ninth symphony, the last one, he wrote when he was completely deaf. It's an amazing piece of music. It is an amazing composition. It's known as the Peace Symphony right at the end. And the libretto, the words for the peace symphony, because of the, the final movement is sung by soloists and a choir, the words were written by a German poet who protested about the cruelty, cruelties of the Napoleonic War. And he said he wanted the, his words and the music to be a kiss for the whole earth. So you can you can you can see uh, in that um, the 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 sense of influence um, that um, that comes through great music in any culture. It doesn't have to be classical music in the Western tradition by any means. You know, you will each of you, I'm sure, know the inspiration and sense of joy and pleasure that you get from listening to your own um, favorite forms of music. Uh, given that time is going on, let me switch to let me switch to um, the the idea of a language for humanity. If you like, this is a crescendo. This is the final part of the book. It's the last chapter. My my argument is that if we're going to deal with the cruelties that you face, the cruelties from the extinction of planet Earth the cruelties from the prospective use of nuclear weapons, the cruelties from the stigmatization over the ages of vulnerable people, the cruelties imposed by the massive social and economic inequalities of neoliberal economics, then uh, you have to have a language that expresses the alternative. I'm very sorry tonight that I'm the one at the moment who's doing all the talking. Because in some ways, having academics do too much talking is in itself a form of violence. Let's first of all, I want to redefine three or four concepts and finish at that point. The first part of the language of humanity is to redefine what we mean by humanity. And it has to mean, it has to be conceived as an expression of interdependence, an interdependence of all people, not me in my nation state, but my respect and enthusiasm for different people, for different cultures. So that interdependence is absolutely crucial. We, it, the lesson of the COVID pandemic is a lesson about the interdependence of everybody. In other words, we're being told that nobody's safe until everybody's safe. Nobody's safe until everybody's been vaccinated. So there is the a pandemic respects no national borders. The, the, the aggressive nationalism is, is an appalling state of affairs. The armaments industry, the concern to dominate, the concern to conquer, the concern to punish is the very opposite of, um, of, uh, of humanity. So I want you to be using constantly the notion of a common humanity, a struggle for collective interests, not selfish ones, a struggle for the common good. So, so humanity needs to be, needs to be um, uh, redefined. 
The second thing, uh, I want humane governance to be redefined. We have to talk about humane governance. And in that respect, there's two forms of security that confront all of you. The security that comes from physical considerations, such as does this country have enough nuclear weapons? Does it have enough nuclear submarines? Does it have enough armed forces? Does it have enough intelligence forces? That's the physical form of security. But most people's security, it comes from, um, from freedom, from access to good health care, access to good education, access to good childcare, access to responsible housing. In other words, social security is central to humane governance. The defense and arms industry is not. And yet there's a massive, pre if you look at the budgets of nation states, the fascination with, um, the fascination with um, uh, having more bigger defense budgets, I tend to call them attack budgets. Uh, look at that in contrast to, to the money being spent on schools and hospitals and universities and so on. So humane governance is about defining social security as opposed to physical military security. The, the last but one issue that I want you to redefine in terms of the language is about human rights. And the last topic, so your students in an audience usually are very happy when they hear a lecturer say, this is the last topic. So I want you to redefine what you understand by human rights. It's about me treating you with dignity and vice versa in any context. It's not, it, human rights is your responsibility. It's inherent in your blood and your minds and your lives. It's not simply, it's not the preserve of lawyers. You know, I, I've been in violent situations, in dangerous situations in particular, I'm thinking at the moment of the civil war in Sri Lanka, when, when Sinhalese, a mob of Sinhalese were pursuing a young Tamil youth. And I was, I was literally that night standing between them. Well, we need, but we had occasion for a, for a long discussion, started off quite violently. And then as we gained understanding between one another, the issue about human rights, my respect for them, their respect for me, didn't have to be uh, explained only in terms in legal jargon. I want to treat you with respect. I want to treat you with dignity. I want to hear what you're going to say. I want to hear your expressions of love for your fellow man. Look, I've gone an hour without using the word love, but at least I've got it in at the end. Okay, last, last point about a language for humanity. Let's redefine what you understand by politics because you're all involved in politics. I, I hear, that no, I can see people shaking their heads. You're all, you've all been, you've all been, <laughs> you've all been the, you've all grown up in families. And, and you've, there were power play. I, I assume that the families didn't always work well all of the time. It wasn't wonderful happiness every hour of every day of every your lives in the family. I imagine that there was conflict. I imagine that there was, there was, there were power struggles. Politics is only about a struggle for power, the struggle for influence. So whether it's in the family or in the school or in the employer's institution or in the university or in the army or in the prison, there is politics. It is not confined to political parties. And if we're going to affect change, we have to be engaged, we have to, go back to what I was saying about the exercise of power, if you're going to have the confidence, the self-respect and the confidence to exercise, uh, to, to exercise influence. Um, I, want, I want a new kind of politics. And I'm not only talking about um, politicians in, in, in your respective countries. 
because there's a ripple effect from the kind of power plays that go on in families, in religious organizations, in non-government organizations, and in the conduct of politics in government. It's the, 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 I want politics only to be about creative, enlightening, non-violent, life-enhancing ways of using power. And if we don't embrace that, if we don't talk about that, then the persistence of cruelty is, is all that is left. And at that point, I think I've talked for too long and I'm looking, if you've got time to breathe deeply, I'm looking forward to your questions. Thank you so much. Thank you so much, Professor Rees, um, for this very stimulating talk. Uh, now, we open the floor for questions and answers uh, and uh, uh, comments and feedback, of course. So I see uh, Arofia George uh, has raised a hand and he wants to ask a question. Please go ahead, Arofia. Hey. So I, I really appreciate your presentation. I've really presented beautifully well the topic and the theme. My reflection is that from the beginning of our existence, quality is part of our existence. Can we imagine a society without quality? That's a tough question. And then at the end, you are talking about languages redefining what we mean by humanity, interdependence, human governance, redefine human rights, redefine politics. Uh, can we also place religions in redefine, redefinition? Do we have to really redefine our understanding of religions in order to understand better our living together? Thank you. Did, did you say, and this, redefine what? Redefine what is meant by religion. Is that is that the question? Yeah. Look, look. Um, I'm. I. I have to say that historically, and this will come as a shock. Religious institutions have been some of the most cruel, and some of the most abusive, and some of the most controlling. They have been an absolute menace to humanity. In whatever whatever the religion, um, we we've just we've I've just been reading hearing today about the cruelty of the num the tens of thousands of young people abused in the French in the Catholic Church in France. I've wit I've witnessed the fascination with with beating young women in parts of Indonesia for standing too close to their boyfriend. I mean, I've I've witnessed the sadism of the of the Taliban who say that, who try to persuade us that their conduct is justified by the by, by Islam. I mean, it's an abs it's it's not, it's about men abusing power. No, I look, I I a lot of my good friends who are Christian and Muslim do amazing work for justice. I don't deny that for one minute. But the actual institution, the powerful institution of religion, whatever religion, has largely been a menace to humanity. That would be my judgment. I'm not sure, I'm, I think I missed the first question. Did, is that correct? That, can you repeat the first question? Imagine a society without cruelty. Is there a possibility of having a society without any cruelty? Without inequality. That's a, hey, we've got, have you got, have I got two hours to answer that question? <laughs> it's, a, it's a very it's a very good question look i'm i'm uh there there are there are society the societies that work best are those that struggle to achieve equality there's no doubt about that the societies that have least violence are the ones that have struggled to achieve equality. The Nordic countries, particularly Norway, Denmark and Sweden are the obvious examples. I'm not saying that they've achieved equality. That's a, that's a, a, a struggle in process. But if you, and I, if, I, if you and I were together in a classroom, the, the equal, even though I might be called the professor and you would be called the student, the, the, the essential feature of the relationship with, between us 
would be me according you dignity and vice versa. In other words, the struggle for equality goes on all the time. Um, it's, it's something we have to fight for. It's in socialist terms, in socialist terms, it's called fellowship. Fellowship, highly beneficial. Good question. Thank you, Professor. Um, Nadia? Uh, hi, sir. Uh, thank you so much for your talk. Uh, I actually did study political science in school, in college, so I did, I could relate a lot of your, uh, the points that you made. I uh, wrote a thesis uh, recently, and rather than the word cruelty, I, uh, I wrote it, it was about uh, violence on, the glo on global anthropocentric uh, biodiversity the global anthropocentric violence on biodiversity. And my question is, should I have used the word cruelty? Why did you use the word cruelty and not violence? And, and not violence. Um, well, because cruelty, cruelty is much more inclusive. Cruelty, for example, um, one of the great forms of cruelty is about social and economic policies. Um, and they don't appear in the first instance to be violent. The, the, the economic policies that say, for example, in America or in most countries, that if you're sick, you have to find, if, if, there is, if there is no universal health insurance in the country, then if you are, by bad luck, you happen to be sick, then you have to pay for it. And if you don't have the money, then you are denied, then you are denied access to medical care. Right. That's an, that's a, the consequence of an economic policy, which you might say at first sight is not violent, but it's certainly it's certainly very cruel. So if, but wouldn't if, you call that indirect violence? Yeah, yeah, it's, it's indirect violence. Absolutely correct. It's indirect. It's that's why that's why I've argued that the that violence, direct or indirect, has been the centerpiece of the policies of just about every government I've looked at. Um, and you know, you're, no, it's a good, it's a good question. Um, I think cruel, see, they don't like the word cruelty. Politicians don't, you say, look, this is, this is cruelty. I mean, at the moment, the, the Australian government turns back boats. It's got, we have a small number of refugees compared to India or Pakistan or, um, or, um, or certain African countries. But the cruelty towards the ones who get here is 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 is, is terrible. They, they, their human rights are strictly speaking not recognized. So the so the it's not it's not obviously violent. But if if you've got thousands and thousands of people wandering around a city with no entitlement to anything, no entitlement to housing, no entitlement to healthcare, no entitlement to education, no prospects of employment. That's that's cruelty, but it's, and it's 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 indirect violence. Some might say it's pretty direct. Thank you. Sir. What was Thank the title? What was the title of your thesis? Uh, glo the global anthropocentric violence on biodiversity. Okay, excellent. Okay, okay. Well, I I need you need to give me a lecture next time. I think. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you, Professor, and thank you, Nadia. Uh, Sakshi, Sakshi, please. Um, good afternoon, sir, from India. Um, sir, my question was that uh, in your lecture, you mentioned the word uh, industrial revolution by William Wordsworth. We talked about neoliberalism and its, and its impact. So my question is actually towards that concern only. So how do you take modernization in the name of technology? And uh, in particular, what's your view on artificial intelligence? Now that it has entered into the American judiciary, and also in the Indian judiciary, how do you feel artificial intelligence is going to harm or benefit the society? So wow. I have a second question also. Uh, so what uh, is your view on military? How, what do you think, uh, what role military play? Does it play in maintaining peace or destroying peace? Or is it a part of patriarchy also? And sir, I have a view also. Uh, but can I say that military comes under one dimension of power till now? Till this day, that's it. Sure. What What's your first name? Sorry, sir. What What's your name? Sakshi, sir. Sakshi. Okay. Okay. What a great question. 
I do, you give me two, have I got two hours to answer the question? <laughs> okay, the first question is about artificial intelligence. Is that right? Look, yes, sir. Beware, beware, beware the idea that a solution to the world's problems is going to come from technology. Beware the the um, beware the uh, the undue reliance on on technology, because um, the 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 question of your humanity it can be easily shoved aside if we think that um, you know caring, for example, in future the caring of the frail elderly is going to be done by robots. Um, you, we've already got. I mean, here's. Here's, here's an example. I've got my mobile phone here, right? I've got my mobile phone. I mean, mo this is this is what a lot of teenagers are doing. I'm sorry, Sajj, I'm sorry, I don't, let me, I'm going to tease you, okay? I'm going to tease you. I don't really, I'm so busy doing this that I don't have time to listen to you. <laughs> um, and I've, excuse me, I've got to take a selfie, I've got to take a picture of myself. Um, uh, so that form of, artificial intelligence is is pervasive and you can see the, the there's a there's an inquiry going on right at this moment in the united states congress about the destructive effects of facebook on young people's on young people's lives so um of course there are huge benefits from, from technology but beware don't be fooled by the idea that here is a panacea you have an intellect you have a spirit you have a heart you have enthusiasm it's your responsibility to question that so your second question is about militarism about the military look militarism is as you expressed it largely um, an expression of one dimension of power you give men and more recently women put them in a uniform give them a gun give them a baton and 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 they're not accountable that they're not accountable so a great deal of i mean a great deal of destruction the murder if you think of world wars the the murder of millions and millions of young men and women became because of militaristic ways of thinking at the moment this this, it looks as though the, the different countries and China are preparing to are preparing for, for war, which is incredibly dangerous. You've had wars between Pakistan and India because men think only with a, in, in a militaristic way because they're, in my judgment, they are illiterate about other ways of exercising power. You know, lit literacy about power, to, because I'm a man and you're a young woman, why do I have any right to bully you? No, exactly. Um, do I have every responsibility to respect you and vice versa and find out more about you and vice versa? Yes, of course. So militarism, militarism is, is I mean, is, is, it's, it's just intellectually mediocre to think that problems can be solved only by having more, more soldiers, more guns, more tanks, more submarines, more airplanes. That is the very opposite of humane governance. I think we, I think we get on very well, actually. <laughs> yes, okay. Thank Good you, question. Sir. Pleasure. Thank you. Uh, Zishan. Uh, greeting, pro greeting, professor. Thank you for your enlightened uh, lecture. Good, good, good to see you. Yeah, actually, uh, I just wanted to question. In order to solve the uh, problem of cruelty and global violence that we are seeing to today, the what I believe the major obstacle that comes across is the relativism, the cultural relativism. Even if we consider a solution of understanding the language of humanity, dignity, and human rights, again a major issue comes is cultural relativism. So in order to establish a uniform peace or a global peace, do we, is it, it is become necessary that we have to 
dethrone the cultural relativism altogether or can we skip it in some sense in some areas in order to establish what we're seeking yeah, can you is it about is it about um um is your question largely about cultural what you called cultural relativism is that what i heard yes sir that cultural relativism sometimes offers like a bigger obstacle in terms of making global decisions regarding yeah. global violence global cruelty uh, so what yes. can we do should we skip it all together like ignore a culture or can we actually amend their culture sure i think yeah, it's a good it's another good question um why don't we invite Mahatma Gandhi to come and help us answer the question? No, I'm, 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 look, there's, there's a struggle all over the world between cultural traditions and human rights. I mean, every peace negotiation I've been involved in, that, that clash comes up. In other words, certain countries say our, our culture which may demand the 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 the, um, the destructive treatment of women is more important than human rights. That the 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 cultural the cultural tradition is is um, is is has to be respected. Even the business of the genital mutilation of young women in Africa. Right, that gets justified by women and by men because they say it's part of their culture. Well, no, I'm sorry, we have a responsibility to say that human rights and humanity have to, at certain points, <coughs> have to transcend cultural considerations. Because when you look at it, the cultural considerations um, are usually have usually been built by men at the expense of women. <laughs> all, all, uh, all, all over the place. Um, I'm trying to think at the moment of, you know, great poets have expressed what you're talking about, about the, about the, the common humanity that runs through, through, through cultures. The, um, uh, there's a wonderful Australian Aboriginal poet. She wrote the poem, um, 70 years ago, it's called All One Race. I'm for humanity, never mind place. I'm for humanity, all one race, she says. In other words, right at this moment, we're all, there's only one planet, as far as I know. There's only one form of existence, as far as I know. There's a great sense of urgency about human survival, as far as I know. It's not, it's not just that I know, we, you, you've, you've seen it in floods in India, in terrible fires across Australia, across Siberia, across North America, uh, massive floods across, across Europe, massive typhoons and hurricanes. So where's cultural relativism in all that? We're talking about a survival of a common humanity. And I, I, just, I just hope I've, I've answered your question. <laughs> Yes, sir, you have answered it, my question. Thank you so much. Oh, okay, thank you. Good to see you. Thank you, Zishan. Ravi, Ravi Dubey. Uh, 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 very good afternoon, sir. My sir, question was from the redefining human rights. As it can be seen in this particular time that uh, every country, every the Asians or the Middle East or the Chinese, these all countries are following their own ways of human rights. The Middle East are having their own practices. Can you go back? Can you go a bit slower? Just go a bit slower. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. For, for my sake. Okay. So it's been saying that in the Middle East, they are following their own sort of human rights redefining. I mean that this is the way of Sharia law and through this, the human rights should be come through into the part. In the Chinese, it's another way that there should be some sort of control and this all things. In the Asian Tigers, after the economical crisis, there was a protest that our own ways of doing a things for the human rights, for the prosperity of us, we will follow our own part of human rights. So how we all are going to redefine a human rights when it's a totally in a mess. All the different ideas are being got together and now there is a part to be redefined the human rights. So, yeah. Look, um, in a way, um, if I was, if you and I were having a conversation uh, uh, with um, 
you know, representatives of Sharia law, for example, about respect for human rights. I probably weren't, I probably wouldn't use the words human rights. I would want to know, am I going to treat you fairly? Do I find you interesting? Why are you going to treat me fairly? Will we enjoy one another's company? In other words, I'm looking for, uh, can you tell me what, um, what's your husband, if I come to your home, what hospitality will you show me? What hospitality will I show you? Because I'm using all those issues of personal relationships to show something about a quality of life without saying, these are my human rights. I, and because, because those considerations are, are, are much more important much more important. You know, I, I spent quite a lot of time in one of the most dangerous parts of the world, the Gaza Strip, which is essentially, essentially Muslim, but it, they don't take it very, the, the, the wonderful young people of Gaza that are so intent on survival, they don't take it very seriously. It's a pretty secular Islam, if you like. They're much more concerned about justice they're much more concerned about clean water. I mean, it's, it's no good if you can't, when you go to Gaza, you can't drink the water. If you want to have a shower, you have to use seawater. If uh, uh, you might have, so the question about, can we breathe the air? Can we drink the water? Is there enough food for you and I to share? Are those are, uh, am I going to enjoy your company? Am I going to understand you better than, you know, tomorrow than I do today? Those are the qualities of our respective humanity that cut through the, the statements, statements written down about religious rules or customs or tribal rules or customs. In the end, we have to survive, you know, <laughs> we, have to, we have to survive together. If, if you and I were faced with a catastrophe of a, a together in a massive flood, right, we'd have to rely on one another to, to respond to the crisis. You wouldn't be saying, well, you know, I'm a Muslim and you're a Christian, so what does, your, what does the Quran say? What does the Bible say? Well, no, we wouldn't. We, we'd say, let's, as two human beings on the planet, let's deal with this crisis. That's what we'd say. And we'd have to use all those expressions of what I call uh, multidimensional power to solve the problem. Now, I'm not sure whether I've answered the question. Sir, there was a, some, so I am having some, a second question. Sir, it was about the nuclear submarine deal which has been signed between the Australia, UK and the America. So, sir, this is a part going to be a very of crucial importance. This deal is going to be. Sir, if there is going to be a nuclear submarine deal and a delivery is going to be the Australian government or a, a part of the deal it has been completed, so somehow it is going to proliferate the nuclear, I mean, the, it's going to give a boost for the small nations, for a part of, uh, as for example, we can take up for the Palestine or for any sure. other small nations that we should also acquire it or we are going to need it. So isn't it this, sir, this is the particular time that uh, a path is going to be followed in a uh, in a nuclear way, and everyone will be trying to get that way. And if a leading country, which uh, is leading us with, through their hegemony and everything, and if that is going to break those all kind of uh, facts which had been always done that uh, disarmament pact, so isn't it going to break those? And these countries are going to follow the suit. Yeah, I only got, I got most of your questions, but for some reason your microphone got switched off halfway through. That's a, Look, I, you, you made a reference to small nations, didn't you? Is that right? Yeah, look, that's absolutely crucial. It's about, it's about sharing resources. It's about sharing responsibility. I mean, many of the nations of the Pacific, their, their, their homes in the next 10 years are likely to be underwater. So they will have to find, they will become refugees. They will find, they will have to find another, another home. So we need to, so the, the question is about, about sharing. It's about interdependence. It's, it's about, it's, it's about um, 
a different way of thinking and living. Um, for example, my my country, Australia is a rich country. It's not it's not it's not as generous as it should be. It should be much more generous. To the north of us is one of the poorest countries in the world called East Timor. Now I don't understand why Australia wouldn't share its resources with East Timor. One of the problems is the is the nation state. The nation state is an invention of the 19th century. And frankly, the, 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 whenever you hear a, a political leader refer to his sovereignty, to the sovereignty of the nation state, then you, you, need, to, um, you need to scratch your head because the nation state is really uh, a cause of so many state power. It's the cause of so many many problems but i like the essence of what you're saying about the sharing with the the smaller countries the poorer countries even even this issue about the distribution of vaccines to combat uh, covid-19 is an, is a test which's been called covid apartheid apartheid meaning separation we'll give we'll give privileges to the rich and we'll give the least possible to the poor. We have we have to we have to challenge that. Thank you, um, Craig. Yeah. Thank you. Um, thank you for the wonderful uh, uh, lecture. I have uh, two uh, questions. One is I need a little more clarity on uh, the three-dimensional power in practice. So we've seen autocracies and we've seen which is or, or one dimensional power in practice in, in terms of nation states or politics. And we've also seen democracies or pluralistic uh, two dimensional powers. But uh, have we, do we have a more concrete example that we can refer to for three dimensional power in uh, nation states as well as uh, or, or anything that we can go to beyond, uh, you know, negotiations and will we it's possible to kind of actually have it um, you know, in, in, in the government maybe, or in policy, and how is that possible? And the second is uh, that, uh, you know, you mentioned the, the, the three challenges to humanity. Um, I just want to know that, uh, uh, do you think, don't you think they're kind of interconnected because, uh, you know, it's the laissez-faire uh, economy, which kind of also leads to um, the climate crisis in a way and, you know, other things. So, I mean, I mean, uh, which one do you, would you think we, we should be like the one we attack first because uh, there's sort of like my view, I think they're interconnected. And then I just wanted to mention one thing, uh, which was uh, when you were talking, uh, you were responding to the militarization part, which uh, at, to Sakshi's question, that actually we've seen, um, I, I work for India Pakistan Peace, and I, we've seen that the peacekeeping forces of, of the UN, which actually, which go to uh, these uh, different African nations to defend uh, people militarily, actually end up doing a lot of human rights abuses. So I just wanted to kind of mention that as that, you know, that yes, militarization, even by UN is kind of like not a, uh, you know, like you said, I just wanted to add that to it. Thanks. Look, it's first of all, um, you, the second question you've answered, I agree with you that the, about the interconnectedness between climate change, possession of nuclear weapons, and, and neoliberal economics. That neoliberal economics says, we have to have as much growth as possible. We have, to, we have to exploit nature's resources every day, every every week, every year, as much as possible. And that's, that's all you hear the economists talking about. We have to have growth. It is an absolute nonsense. It's a destructive nonsense. And it's what's caused what's contributed to climate change. And it's, what's, it's, it's about the accumulation of power, which is in one case, the accumulation of nuclear weapons. So you're, you're brilliant. You can give the lecture next time and I'll sit in the class. You've, you've answered that one. Now, the first question is a beautiful question. What do you mean by, can, you, can we elaborate about multidimensional power? It, you can see it, you can see it in, uh, in every possible context. I used to run um, the Center for Peace and Conflict Studies in a big university, a powerful university. Um, we, 
it was a great for the first let me let me explain in simple terms what what characterized that culture we we built a culture there uh which in which people felt welcome first of all i insisted there should be toilets for the men and toilets for the women secondly i insisted that there should be pleasant places to sit quietly and read if necessary thirdly i insisted there should be a kitchen where people could prepare food for one another if they needed to and so there was a, there was a culture of support and of great of great fun of, of great laughter of great humor and if you like of expressions of love for one another right okay i was i was the professor i was accountable for it but 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 we had a sense of reciprocity and equality and and um and and you we knew how to challenge the power structures that that operated in the city in the state and in the university so so there was within that culture that multidimensionality was possible i've seen it in great in great um in dance groups in, in ballet companies where where there's reciprocity and respect and pleasure and and enjoyment i'm not sure that i've really seen it in the policies of governments i've not although that's a bit unfair because after that you you you're too young to remember or to know but after the second world war there were two countries that were completely smashed to bits they were the losers one was germany the other one was japan right but the the decision after the war after the second world war was that every effort should be made to rebuild those countries it was called in the case of germany it was called the marshall plan it was about resources from largely america but not entirely america given to rebuild germany and the same happened with the economic miracle that occurred in japan so there was a kind of instead of after the first world war there was a desperation to punish the losers and the only thing that that did was to guarantee the second world war that's all it did it guaranteed the second world war whereas um so there can be so i'm a, you know archbishop Desmond Tutu of South Africa was a good friend of mine. He wrote a book called No Future Without Forgiveness. Right? So there's a kind of uh, multi-dimensionality of that statement. Somebody once asked me on a radio station, well, tell me what, what do you mean by multi-dimensional power? And it happened that a, a famous orchestra was playing was playing in the Sydney Opera House at that moment. And they were playing a symphony by an amazing uh, composer called Mahler. And I just said to the guy, well, why don't, go and listen to that piece of music. Go and listen to that piece of music and you'll see what I mean by multidimensional power. If yeah, I'm sure, just, just watching you this evening, that if I came to your home and you offered me hospitality, right? That would be an expression, in my view, of multidimensional power. It would be, it would be a statement between human beings of their, you know, respect for one another. Hospitality is a great example, I think. Sorry, I'm taking too long. Thank you. Um, Simra Khan. Uh, so uh, thank you for the lecture. Uh, I have a question about this thing that when we talk of a war situation, so in a war situation, the accounts that I normally see, uh, because I'm a literature student, so I read, I've read a lot of it. Uh, so the accounts that I've seen are mostly on the violence against women and not against the men. Uh, for example, I'll give this uh, example of Bosnian wars. So the uh, overnight uh, around millions of um, Muslim men, men were evacuated, uh, women were evac evacuated and children also, and men were slaughtered. So the accounts of the women are available to us, but the accounts of the men are not. 
so is it sure. uh, like that the pandemic that we've uh, been discussing the again the domestic violence one so isn't it that uh, the history and literature has been kinder towards women in this case yep look it's a great the fact that you ref, ref, refer to the to the bosnian war is excellent because one of the worst massacres occurred in srebrenica the town of srebrenica when the serbs took 8000 men and boys away and just and murdered them just slaughtered them so look there's plenty look violence um violence anywhere is appalling um injustice injustice anywhere is appalling and there's plenty of examples that um uh of men of violence towards men i mean for example in the in the afghan war that's just ended uh i think something like in australia about 50 50 um soldiers were killed young men right but when they came home 500 of them committed suicide right and the same has happened in in force arm, armed forces all all over the place the suicide rate among young men mostly young men but some women as well who've served in armed forces it's just it's just terrible so the and the and the, the investigations that have occurred throughout the world into sexual abuse sexual abuse of of um of um of girls and boys in religious institutions shows no distinction between between men and between male and female but um the 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 revelations that occurred today in France about the sexual abuse in the catholic church was disproportionately about young men being abused it wasn't about young women because the ones who are being trained for the priesthood were only men but you'd have to say that you'd have to say that most of the disproportionate use of power abuse of use of power the people on the receiving end are women and 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 the equality i mean the challenge around the world is about equality between men and women i mean it's about it's about the rights of women i mean if you've got something like 50% of women around the world being being illiterate not able to read and write that gives them no power no power whatsoever so um and frankly religious institutions do do very little about that in my view it's a pity we need to have a longer conversation <laughs> thank you yes, thank you thank you sir um thank you thank you Saba, go ahead. Oh, uh, I'm sorry. So good That's afternoon, okay. sir. Um, it, it was a very enlightening hour. And my question to you is regarding the first question you received. So since um, I was, uh, you know, I was in a very late line, so I'll just um, help you by recalling that you know it was about the religion part. Sure. Of Mr. George. so what i want to see about that is uh, that your view of uh, that religion has been a very big menace uh, has been a very big menace to the world i want to say that um, being a lawyer like when i read the constitution of india so uh, a lot of the social norms which are already present in our indian society were you know taken in by the constitution um, such as integrity dignity of the individual socialism fraternity so my question to you here is that if there was no religion then what on what basis uh, do you think the social norms would you know would would um, would be formed and sure. if suppose religion is um, is totally cut out is totally mitigated so in that case what will be the um borderline the uh, what do you say um the idea for setting up laws so laws on what what will be the uh, idea for governance of the society that will be such sure sure look um that's another a very significant question i think my my criticism of is of religious institutions not so much 
religious beliefs, but the way the institutions have operated as though they would they were a law in themselves. Because one of the great issues, one of the great struggles in history in order to write law was the struggle between what we used to say was church and state, between religion and state. And most democracy and democracies only evolved on the basis that religion and the state should be separate. In other words, the, so one of the objections, for example, to the to the state of Israel is that they say you can only be a you can only be a citizen in that country if you're a Jew, right? So uh, the same applies to a theocracy like Iran, that you can only you can only have full citizenship if you agree with all the rules of of a, of a particular religion, and yet if you like civilization or civility, which is a basic, which is a, a secular notion, it, 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 which becomes the basis for law all over the place, is, um, is, is a much more um, personal way of talking about the way we work together. I mean, if I treat you in a civil manner, I it's irrespective of your ethnicity or religion, um, that that becomes the basis, what well, became the basis for what was called the never again, the never again thesis about the Universal Declaration, right? It, was, it wasn't just a product of the wet, it was never, never again genocide, never again atrocities. It was at the time, and this is this is for me the philosophical basis of 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 you as a lawyer struggling to say, well, how should the law be? Well, it was about the highest aspirations of men and women, right? What, what can we aspire to? What can we hope for? And that, and, and when, we, when we reach agreement about what we can hope for, we write a law, right? And, beyond, and, the, and the law doesn't get changed until we find something better. So, so that dialogue, um, I, I don't want to say it's going to. This is going to come. This bit's going to come from religion. This bit's going to come from um, from atheists or agnostics. What I am going to do is to is to be in conversation with you regularly till we till the chemistry of our of our shared knowledge and shared uh, shared ethics emerges with some statement about 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 uh, about law but the essential struggle was always between religion and the state i mean one of the problems of 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 trump was that he tried to behave even though he was the most unreligious person ever he's tried to behave as though religion and the state should be the same that that that, that was what that is what has caused so much conflict you know, he's put all these right-wing religious people in the Supreme Court, right? So, so, so he's trying to make law not according to the principles of a common humanity, but according to certain religious precepts. What I mean, how do you respond to that? You look as though you'll be a good lawyer. You could represent me, couldn't you? <laughs> I think you can't, we can't, we can't, I can't pretend that the, the great traditions of Buddhism and Hindu and Christianity and uh, Judaism and this don't exist, that's absurd. My question is about the power of the institutions. And particularly, particularly with regard to the treatment of women. That's a key issue. Uh, moving on, um, Furkan. Um, just just one uh, second. Um, so okay. just, sure, I was uh, muted. So so um, uh, professor, we can conclude by saying that you know it is uh, essentially the institutions which is one of the major problems, and not uh, really the religions, which are the actual menace. Is that correct, sure. professor? Yeah, yeah. I mean, I think the institutions, even the word, has the notion of inflexibility around it. 
it, it, if there's inflexibility, you never move on. You, you, um, and it's particularly, um, and, and the people in power love tradition. They don't want to, they don't want to give up power. That's, that's one of the problems of domestic violence. Men don't know how to exercise power in that multi-dimensional way that I've just mentioned. Because you don't, any, any, anybody can be, can, as a man, I can say to you, all I want is your obedience. I don't have to be very clever to say that. So when, and when that behavior becomes institutionalized, then there's a problem. Thank you, Professor. Thank you. Okay. Good to talk. Good to meet you. Uh, Furkan, you don't want to ask a question now? I don't see your uh, hand. You, uh, you I'm, I'm here, yeah. Yeah, okay, great. Hello, hello, Professor Rees. Uh, hi, for... hi, good. Okay. I'm just... Uh, I have a question. Uh, I was actually enjoying your lecture. Thank you for uh, your sharing your experience and everything. Uh, but the uh, only thing that I wanted to ask, I hope you're hearing me now. Yeah, I hear you very clearly. Yeah, I, only thing I wanted to ask uh, is the anti-vaccine community. Uh, you were actually talking about it a bit short, but still. Uh, and you said, we are not safe until everybody gets the vaccine. And then also you add a very original description uh, COVID apartheid and yes. things is actually a very uh, hot topic now in the world and uh, we were talking about the stigmatization and the victimization and the pluralistic democracies and in the world western uh, society this is like more pluralistic and people are now uh, st standing up against this vaccine uh, vaccine things uh, in their countries like yesterday we had a big riot in the at the streets of uh, Ljubljana I'm actually joining you from Slovenia Ljubljana and the oh, people are, okay yeah yeah people are now very uh, furious uh, about this uh, uh, limitations uh, just because they are not vaccinated they cannot buy anything from the super supermarkets they cannot go to the coffee shop restaurants or even the petrol station just it is uh, the end of their life it seems like and this is kind of also indirect violence, I guess, if I understood correctly from your words. Uh, yeah. What do you think about yeah. this? Uh, because uh, yeah. I'm also vaccinated because of my job, uh, because I needed to have it. But I was also questioning a bit, and I also wanted to hear your uh, explanations yeah. about in this modern society and this yeah. realistic sure. point of view. Look, that's a great question, and it's a great example, and it's... Um, you know, there have been riots in Australia in, 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 in major cities uh, by, pe by people who, um, they're, well, they're protesting. Uh, there's a very small percentage protesting about the vaccines. Um, and now the, the controversy that you refer to about not being able to, um, to go to supermarkets to enter employment if you're not vaccinated. Look, there are two, there are two, in every, in every, piece of policy in every articulation expression of law there are usually there's usually conflict in the first case with regard to the case for everybody being vaccinated this is about a relatively unselfish commitment to say that my um, my my safety has to be identical to yours in other words, I'm only, I have to have respect for your safety by, by making sure that I'm vaccinated. It's a collective, it's a collective interest. Even if I don't know you, I have an obligation, a moral obligation to respect your, your freedom by saying, yes, I'll, I, I'll take the, the scientific evidence at the moment as best I can. The second issue where the conflict occurs is is where it's made a form of uh, exclusion of that group who, who are not vaccinated. Is it that they are not vaccinated or they refuse to get vaccinated? Which is it? I mean, it's both. It's both. Yeah. Look, it, if, we, if we said, well, we just use one dimensional power, if we, if we, if we conduct government 
uh, we conduct administration in that way. We just we would just simply say, I'm sorry, but you don't have any rights. You refuse to get vaccinated. But with every conflict, there has to be an attempt to find what I what what the peace negotiators call a win-win situation. I mean, I need to know more about the uh, I, I, about the um, the rationale of the people who've been denied. Um, um, there may be good reasons why they don't get vaccinated. There may there would have to be. This is the second point of policy. There always have to be exceptions to the rule. You can't, except in a dictatorship, except in the military, except when you run a prison, you usually have to have an exception to the rule. You can't, it, it, it's very difficult to have just one rule for everybody because there'll always be exceptions. There'll be some people who are disabled, some people who are sick, some people who are um, not able to, to um, express themselves. Um, there's be some people who are uh, without resources of any kind. So, in the, the first rule, the first rule, if you like, is that everybody gets vaccinated. The second rule, which in a way is no rule, is that the, the, you have to find exceptions. And and um, even though the movement is to is 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 to is to have everybody vaccinated with the same the same rights and entitlements, but there has to, that's my objection to the treatment of refugees. You can't just exclude people. There have to be, there have to be exceptions. Otherwise there's, otherwise there's no humanity. But we need, but, but my, my, my style, if you like, is to say, look, you and I need to go to a coffee shop in Slovenia. I need to, or, or, or do we need to have a beer and, and we need to talk about it at length. Thank you. Yeah, sure. Uh, uh, we're always, okay. We're always welcome. <laughs> okay. Thank you very much. All right. Thank you for your time. Uh, we have, Professor, we have uh, 11 minutes to go and uh, four more questions. So, okay. Uh, yeah. I'll, uh, I'll try and, I'll try and be, give shorter answers. Dipanchu, uh, also keep, uh, Dipanchu, please keep your question as brief as possible and pointed. Yes, sir. Uh, first of all, thank you so much for your intriguing lecture. Uh, I would be very uh, to the point. Uh, you made us imagine an utopia, a world which is based on humanity and humanitarian values and not on security, of course. And you then gave a pathway how we can uh, redefine the things, right? Yeah, redefine the key concept, the basic concepts. But if, if, we, uh, if we take these, these basic concepts like human rights, humanity, human govern governance, and in particular, uh, particular human governance, when you shared uh, that the human government should be redefined, right? Uh, social security should be the focus. Social security should be the focus. Then how can you, like, how will you see that these politicians and how our government, how our democracy works, uh, these will be possible. Like well, politician, like these things are long gestating periods. Like they take long gestation. So, sure. how they will be interested in these things? Yeah. Look, everything comes down to what values we hold, irrespective, it, it, in in our personal lives, or if you're trying to influence government policy. It totally depends on the values. I'll give a quick example about. The, the most important feature of a civil society in all the peace negotiations in the post-conflict situations I've been in is about the introduction of universal health insurance, right? That derives, that means that you will, it, you will have a high standard of care and it will cost you nothing. It will, you will be entitled to it according to need as a citizen. Now that derives from a, it derives from values that 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 I want to be. It's what what is known in my terms as the gift the gift relationship. If by bad luck you are sick, and by good luck I am not sick, we, but I don't know you. By my contribution to your insurance, I am contributing 
to your well-being, right? So and that that issue, all those issues that you've just mentioned in your question, come back to the basic values. It's it's really about altruism dominating over selfishness, about altruism dominating over egoism. It's 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 us together, not me, me, me. Thank you. Catherine? Okay. Good evening, sir. You mentioned about an utopian world in the class, and the society we live right now is far from utopia. So what should our society as a whole should adopt? What is the first step that we should adopt to build a harmonious and united world? Can you? I cannot. You're only... Uh, that's better. Yeah, I can see you a bit more. Can you... Can you just repeat the question? So you said about uh, an utopian world, right, during the class. So yes. what should be the first step that a society as a whole should undertake to develop a united and harmonious world? Why should it? What was the last bit? The last. What should be the first step that a society should undertake to build a harmonious world? Oh, okay, great. Okay, what's what's the first step? Look, it's about it's about reciprocity between between us. In other words, I only want for you what I want for myself, right? I only want for your family what I expect from my family. I only want from your society what I expect from my own. That's reciprocity. That that it's 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 about the gift. We're coming back to values. It's about gift given to the stranger without the expectation of a reward. You know, I don't know you, but if you were sick, I would, I have, I have an obligation to offer something to help you, right? It's that, so that reciprocity is always the first step. It's first step in caring for children, for small children, first step in caring for the frail elderly, First step in ensuring that the caste system in, in, in India should be should be outlawed, that, that discrimination and punishment of all kinds should should no longer um, exist. Um, sorry, that's a lot of first steps. Thank you, sir. I love the, I love the question. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, Nasir. Nasir, please turn on your camera and unmute yourself. Uh, yes, sir. So actually, I'm having unstable network connection. So can I go without uh, just... Okay. Okay. All right. yeah, okay. okay. So, sir, my question is that basically there are a lot of provisions and conventions on uh, international law regarding these human rights, torture and cruelty. And so basically, my question is that why these uh, international laws are... Uh, unenforceable on domestic countries like uh, what need to be done for the implementation of international laws on the domestic countries like as you see the ongoing situation in Tal Taliban uh, like uh, 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 means uh, that uh, international law is not prevailing in uh, domestic countries so what need to be done for that yeah. so yeah look it's it's a it's a great um, question I mean it, it's a it's a struggle, it's a work in progress. I mean, even, the, for example, take the International Criminal Court. Well, the Americans don't, the Americans don't recognize it. They decided that even if their, if their military commit massive offenses overseas, they're not going to be held liable. So the, the question of you, see, the question of universality of what I called interdependence is we have to struggle with that all the time and if you have opportunity in your lives and your careers to go to different countries to meet different people we have to argue uh, this um this notion of interdependence which which is expressed in international law we take the the very the very important refugee convention of 1951 that says anybody has an entitlement to flee persecution and seek refuge in another country that's a fundamental right and yet many countries are not don't recognize it they call people they call people illegals when they're not illegals so um you can see that struggle going on with you know as i said earlier there are 65 million refugees, at least people on the move. Um, 
it's 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 crucial it's uh, international law international law is the best we've got the universal of human right declaration of human rights is the best we've got the state the convention on the rights of the child of all children all children is the best we've got we have to struggle every day of our lives to repay respect to those principles all right i'm, so, I'm sorry i couldn't see you yes uh push picker is this the last question or uh then we have two more actually okay okay yes. that's okay that's okay yeah if uh, it's okay for you yes uh, all right push picker please wait i'm audible you are to me, but I think your voice is slow. Could you speak a little louder? Uh, good evening. Am I audible? Okay. Yes. Yeah, you're very audible. I can okay. see you uh, too. Yeah. So, uh, sir, as you have mentioned uh, that you have been a part of some peace negotiations and we were talking uh, about cultural relativism. So, uh, I just want to ask your uh, uh, perspective on the part that uh, do the leaders using cultural culture really as a tool to you know bind us together or as, as a mean to exercise autonomy yes well well good question i look um there's a great movement around the world to exercise all, the autonomy of nations you know america wants to wants to be great again the british want to be isolated and go it alone mahendra modi wants you know something special for india and 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 the president of China wants to um, conquer half the world, as far as I can see, or a large part of it. There's no future in that. The, the COVID pandemic tells us that. The problem of um, global warming tells us that. So when I'm in negotiations with people, and it might be just over a piece of domestic violence, the question is, what do you want from your life? How, much, how long have you got left on the planet? What are you going to do with your life for your people? What I mean, why is why is this why is this autonomy important when when no man is an, there was a great poet of the, the 16th century, no man is an island, a law into himself. Every part person is the part of the main. In other words, I am a part of your life, you are a part of mine. We only live, there's only one planet, there's only one life. And, and yet we be, we behave with such destructive policies that we threaten we threaten existence. So I'm for um, uh, I'm not very happy with autonomy. I'm, I'm fascinated by by interdependence. Thank you, sir. Okay. Um, who are you? Hello. Hello. Good to see you. Uh, thank you, sir. Thank you for the lecture. Uh, actually, sir, I am from Afghanistan and I live in Afghanistan. So during the talk, the topic about Afghanistan was a little bit hot. So first of all, I would like to ask my question. And then I would like to, if there was a chance, I would like to have some brief information regarding the situation that's going on over here. So my question is that to have you and maintain, are you yes, in sir? Afghanistan at the moment? Yeah, 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 I am. Okay, okay. Uh, my question is to maintain a peace environment. Is it dependent on religion? And if yes, how it is possible to keep safe this religious institution from leading people astray? From leading people astray? Yeah, keep safe yeah. from, to keep well, safe people. Sure. Look, I, don't, being I think I think I think the history of the world, the history over centuries, is that safety safety doesn't necessarily have much to do with religion. I mean, it's because religion has been taken over by certain dominant groups. I mean, are you Pashtun or Hazara? Well, actually, I'm Tajik. Oh, you're Tajik. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay, I saw your name. Okay, you're Tajik. Yeah. Look, um, I think. I mean, safety, safety is about the safety is about um, can you breathe the air? Can you drink the water? Do you have enough food? 
Can you walk the streets? Can you, can you get the education you need? Can you get the health care you need? With irrespective of age or gender or ethnicity, right? Now, religion frequently gets in the way of all those considerations. It, it, it gets in the way. Um, religion, I mean, <laughs> so because the issues about safety of, of, of anybody has to do with all those day-to-day -day consideration. When I've been in the Gaza Strip, you know, I'm negotiated with Hamas, which is a basically um, a fundamentalist Muslim organization. But once we've got over the introductions to one another, they know as well as I know that the issues about water, care, uh, about um, employment, about income, about um, about sewage even. I mean, the Israelis have bombed all the sewage plants. Try living in a country without with no sewage. So there, you know, there we need to talk about those things, not the not the false claims that are made by religion. There's too many false claims made by religion that don't that don't address water and sewage and housing and food and the education of women and, and girls. They don't, they don't. They, they're <laughs> They're irresponsible and very, in my book, very naughty, but but very but very dangerous. I mean, one of the questions. I, I mean, I'd like you. I'd love you and I to have more conversation. But take the Taliban, for example. What 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 did, did none of those tens of thousands of young men were there no sisters? Did they presumably if there if there are forty thousand young Taliban wandering the streets with beards and guns? Am I supposed to believe that they didn't have any sisters? If so, where are the 40,000 sisters? And, what, and how were they treated? Nobody seems to ask that question. Even the Western experts on Afghanistan don't ask that question. Sorry, um, you have another question, don't you? Well, no, you no, no, I, 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 I just wanted to add some information regarding the situation that was going on on the Afghan government before Afghanistan collapsed by the hand of Taliban. Yep, yep, yep. You know, no. Please tell us. There was, there was a secret uh, nego peace negotiation between the Taliban and the United States. And during the, that negotiation, the United States gave a direct order to the Afghan government to release 5,000 Taliban in prison, which were in prison. Yes. So they were the most dangerous people that they have put their, the Afghan soldiers, they have put their life at risk so that they, had, they took them under their presence. So that led to, to the collapse of Afghanistan. So uh, what I want to say is that the Taliban didn't come by themselves. Somebody just handed over the Afghan government to the Taliban. And, and it, it's, I think it's quite clear. Yep, yep. No, but I accept your argument. Are you safe? Do you feel safe yourself? Uh, I will actually... Somehow, I don't think so. Nobody is safe here. Right. If, do you enough? Can you get food at the moment? What's the food yeah, supply? Of yeah, yeah, of course. Okay. But the West, it's very interesting because the Western media talks about a humanitarian crisis in Afghanistan. Of course, yeah, yeah, it is. It is people, most of the people has, just don't have money for food. They just took their uh, house, house materials outside the, their house and they're selling it in order to find money to for life. Yeah. yeah, look, I wish I wish we could have a much longer conversation. Several. I've Thanks. really enjoyed I've enjoyed meeting you and I thank you for what you've said. Thank you, sir. Thank Me you. too. My pleasure. Thank you, sir. Um, Professor, we have exceeded the time limit, but we still have one more question. Uh, okay, no, go for it. No. Take it. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, of course, of course. Uh, Charu, Charu, please go ahead. Mm -hmm. And uh, if possible, please turn on your camera. Hello, sir. I I'm really sorry. I'm. Uh, I won't be able to turn on my camera. I have some problem with my laptop right now. Um, okay. That's okay. So um, your whole lecture was quite insightful, and like I. 
got to know a lot of her things. Uh, one minor thing that was pondering uh, my mind was uh, you you talked about stigmatization. You talked about how women are majorly affected by it. So do you think that uh, if we had gender neutral laws, if we have gender neutral language used in, in terms of framing laws, would ha would it have like influenced the concept of cruelty in the contemporary society? Or if it's not, then what an individual at an individual level should do considering that everything which revolves around violence and cruelty is about power dynamics, which I just feel that it, it's, it's it's a whole system that is very difficult to change. Uh, like yeah, it cannot sure. happen in a day. So wow. what an individual can do? Uh, it's a great question to end the evening with. Look, I liked your phrase, it couldn't happen in a day. Um, but to go back to the first point you made about language, what you call new, gender neutral language, the language is important. The way we use language, even the way we dress, the way we, um, you know, the non because language is frequently not just about words, but about all sorts of nonverbal ways of communication. I mean, I, unfortunately, I can't see your face. You can't, I don't, you can probably see me, I don't know. Um, um, the question about, and this is a great point to end the evening on, that when you say nothing, you, you can't change these institutions in a day. Well, look, my philosophy is you have to have a small victory. You can't, as an individual or, well, first, first of all, I'd say you can't do anything by yourself. I've, you know, I don't achieve things by myself. I work in collaboration with people like you, right? And, 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 other, and all the other students I've met this evening. And, but, but you have to have small victories on a Friday in order to feel that it's worth getting up out of bed on a Monday. You have to, you have to, you can't, you can't achieve equality of, the, equality of the sexes, for example, overnight, but you can achieve small victories for, 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 for so many people. You know, I've met many people who come, who used to come to me uh, because I've been a social worker as well in different countries. And they came feeling powerless, but they didn't, they didn't expect me to have a magic wand, but they did expect, they did benefit from being taken seriously, being listened to, generating ideas about what the next steps might be for them. And those were small victories, uh, which, as I've said, um, makes it possible to get up with a sense of optimism on Monday morning. I hope that helps. Yes, so thank you. Okay. Okay. Um, thank you so much, Professor. Uh, so with this, we come to the end of our today's very interactive uh, and a wonderful session. Uh, thank you for joining us. Uh, and thank you all for your questions and comments. Uh, I'll see you uh, tomorrow at the same time, 3 p.m. Thank you, Professor, once again. No, look, thank, thank you for inviting me. And, and thank you to all the students. I really, I really enjoyed their questions. Thank you for being such a good host. Um, and hopefully we'll meet again. Yes, yes, Professor. Okay, thank you so much. Okay. Thank you right. so much. Good night. Yeah, good night. Good night. Good night.